All right. So I, I think we're ready to start, though. Um, so hi, guys. I'm David. Uh, I work for a company called Proofpoint. I'm the architect responsible for all of our cloud security um, products. And Proofpoint is a security company. We do a lot of data processing, and we run very large distributed system, which is like the origin of this, uh, of this session. Um, just as, as, as a bit of background, so I joined Proofpoint about a year and a half ago, uh, just after Proofpoint acquired the startup, which became the core of the security product we have right now, like a cloud access security product. Um, and that product was written as most startup products in 100% startup mode, which is, uh, you know, just get features in and get, you know, get acquired as quickly as possible. And every, all the important stuff like, you know, debug, being able to debug, to debug it or, you know, monitoring stuff, it all took backseats to getting features in, you know, getting customers and getting acquired, which I'm not criticizing. That's, that's how a startup actually builds a product and sells it, right? That's how the industry works. But then what you end up with is a, is a product which is full of features, but very hard to maintain, very hard to actually run in an enterprise environment in production. And so when I joined Proofpoint, that was pretty much my primary focus, which is taking this startup product, uh, which had 10 customers uh, at the time, and then growing it into an actual like enterprise company grade product with 1,000 customers. We now have about 1,000 customers a year and a half later. Uh, and we have more than uh, 200 times as much data and traffic and all that. Um, and obviously, the f in the first few months, I would join the company and we started working on the product. Everything was on fire all the time, right? And so this brings me to talking about observability a lot because, again, observability um, is a feature of a computer system which, which tells you how much information you have about the internal state of the system, hopefully uh, in order to gain an understanding of what the system health is if it's behaving correctly at the moment, right? And so a, a system can have very poor obser observability or very good observability, right? It's not a binary thing. It's either observable or not. It's a, it's a scale, right? And, the, and so a lot of the talks uh, the past couple of days talked about this whole, you know, it's, uh, there are signposts on the way to good architecture. And so observability is not different. It's, evo it's something that you evolve in the system as you move it along. And you find problems and you, where, where you lack uh, tools to debug it or to understand what's going on, and so you add observability there until you have something that can actually inform you of the product end to end. Right, and that's the whole point. Um, and so uh, the system we're talking about, it's uh, a very large, uh, mostly Kafka-based system, lots, lots of microservices. Uh, it, ha it had like a couple of dozen when I joined, and now we're up to about a hundred different microservices running over you know, thousands of VMs. And so the whole thing, at any given moment, back when I joined, we couldn't really tell if the thing was working. And we had no tools to actually know for sure if stuff was working. And so this really crystallized for me when one day our VP of sales called uh, my boss in the middle of a sales demo to ask if the system was working because the UI was up, but none of the data was showing. And so if the VP of sales calls you to ask if the, your product is working, that means you don't have enough observability in your system. Right, because that's that's the way you find about issues in your system. Right. By the way, for any if, if any of the Proofpoint customers or future customers watch this video, it's not this way anymore. It's much better now. Right. This is all in the past. Just to be clear. <laughs> all right. Um, okay. So, what is observability? Let's let's talk about what what it is, because I'm going to keep using the word observability all, all the time. Um, and so let's agree on what that actually means. Right. And. There's a lot of different uh, ways of defining it, but for the purposes of this talk, I want to say that observability is a feature of a system where you have the ability to answer questions that broadly fall into one of two categories. Is everything okay? And if things aren't okay, what exactly isn't okay and why it's not okay, right? And if you can answer those two questions about your system with confidence at any given moment and in any kind of depth level of the system, then you have good observability in the system. And if I can ask you right now, are you certain that the system is working exactly as you expect? And you say, well, I don't know. I mean, if the customers call and say something's wrong, I guess we'll know. Then you probably lack some observability in your system. Um, and so that, that's, like, that's my very broad definition, right? And so observability isn't, isn't a product. You know, it's not a, f it's not a 
technology you can do. It's a, a property of your system which helps you make decisions based on if it's healthy or not healthy or if it's pro functioning correctly. And hopefully it lets you uh, lower the amount of time it takes you to find the problem and you know, find what's causing it and hopefully fix it. Right? And so, hmm. and so if you can answer these two questions, is anything wrong right now? But I think, uh, okay, so let's, let me ask you, how many, how many people work on a production system right now? Something that's actually customer use, right? How confident are you at this moment, right now, sitting here, that the system is working? One, one guy, two, two, three, yeah. okay. How can you tell? Because the customers didn't call and complain? <laughs> okay. And if someone calls you with pager, what, can you say what the first step is going to be of what you're going to look at? Okay, good. You guys are in a good place. That was like six people out of like, uh, I don't know, more than six. More than six. I didn't count. So the rest of you don't seem very confident. <laughs> uh, and so it's a good thing that you're here. Um, okay, so you know how things in tech generally come in waves, right? So like a couple of years ago or a few years ago, suddenly everything was about microservices. Any conference you went to, there was a whole track about microservices and all that stuff, right? And it's not, it's not anything new, right? Microservices and service-oriented architecture has been with us for decades, right? We had stuff like that in the 90s. But then, you know, Google pioneered a lot of the early work in there, and then the rest of the industry caught up, and now everybody's doing microservices. But once you have microservices, suddenly you discover, okay, well, there's a whole bunch of processes we need to run. How do we manage and deploy them? And so everything became about containers, because that's how you, know, you manage the chaos of how, de how deploying, uh, deploying microservices and all that stuff. And so all the conferences had containers and blah, blah, blah. And then a couple of years afterwards, now everyone has containers, or presumably lots of people have them, and everyone has microservices, and now suddenly the industry is discovering Okay, so we have all of these machines running all of these processes, and we don't have good visibility into what exactly is going wrong and why, why, how they're working. And so the last few years, there's been a lot more attention uh, given to observability, and there's new companies, there new, start new startups showing up, providing services to, that actually help you build observability into your system, and there's more you know, buzz around this. And so any b technical blogs you read about observability or uh, podcasts you listen to, you'll generally run into something that looks like this, right? You'll find some kind of graph, uh, which looks like a Va Venn diagram of three things, like logs, metrics, and traces. Um, and in this, in this case, logs, I'm sure I don't need to explain to everybody. Logs, you, you know, put logs, uh, write out logs out of your system. Metrics, in this case, I don't mean metrics as in so when I say metrics, how many people thought CPU load and like disk and stuff? Okay, so that's, that's important. You have to have like system level metrics. But in this case, what I'm talking about is application level metrics, like counting how many requests your service gets and what kind of requests, you know, success or failure and stuff like that. So application level metrics. And traces, again, I don't mean traces in like the Linux sense where you do S trace and you, f and you look at the kernel uh, receiving uh, system calls. In this case, traces in, in, the, moder in the more modern sense of distributed tracing, being able to take a single transaction that spans your entire system and trace it end to end and figure out all the things it touched and all the things that happened to it, right? And so distributed tracing going from the origin of the transactions, for, for example, like a web server getting a request from the browser all the way through all the services it touches to the database and back. And being able to say, okay, I know all the things that happened in between and if anything broke, I have a trace of that and I have a log of that. Right, and so you'll generally find one of these, and depending on which vendor is giving the presentation, the Venn diagram is going to look different. Like if you go to a uh, Elasticsearch meetup, the circles will be really close together and will be a sign right in the middle because that's what they're trying to sell. And if you go to like a, you know, uh, listen to a presentation from someone from uh, Lightstep, which is a company that sells applica application performance services, then the Venn diagram is going to be skewed towards like traces and the logo is going to be in the traces. And so a lot of this conversation tends to be very product focused, right? Because the people who are driving it are the vendors who are trying to sell you products to help you with various aspects of observability, which I don't necessarily agree with. I don't like it. That's why the whole, this slide is like so-called three pillars. It's not really the three pillars because logs and metrics and traces, they're not products, right? They're technologies which can broadly help you build observability into your system, right? And if you go back, observability is actually your ability to say if, if anything's wrong and what is and how to fix it. And so 
I don't like this idea of, you know, there's three things you need to have, and then you have observability. You can have logs, metrics, and traces in your system, and still have no idea what's going on. So that's not a prerequisite for observability. That's just a bunch of different technologies that help you build stuff that will help you manage your system, which we'll talk about throughout the rest of this talk. Right? And so uh, also this approach, I think it's missing a bunch of stuff. So for example, there's no mention of automation, which is a huge part of actually building uh, observability into your system. You have to run some kind of automation to test that the system is working at any given time. And you don't usually find uh, references to CICD, which is a lot of context. Because if something is going wrong, and you can connect the deployment that happened, you have a lot more context to say, oh, OK, so this happened because something got deployed. OK, and so this, this kind of three pillars of observability thing, it's missing the important issue, which is observability is a property of a system. It's not a product you can just buy and you know, magically have observability. Right. And another thing which bugs me oftentimes when you talk about, you know, oh, you should use New Relic for metrics, or you know, do you have Elasticsearch for logs, stuff like that. It tends to bring the conversation down to very low-level implementation details. And I think before you can start talking about, you know, specific technologies or vendors you can use to help yourself, you should talk about why you want observability in the first place. And really, the primary reason we actually want the system to be observable is because we want to have to give the customers a better experience. We want to have a better user experience. Right? You want your system to be working not because you like it. It's because you have customers, and they, ex and they paid a lot of money for your system, and they expect it to be working. Right? And you want the system to be fast and have you know, low latency, because that's how you provide a good user experience to your customers. Right? Because that eventually, all those customers pay us money, and that's why we stay employed, and that's why we get to come to Malaga. So essentially, observability directly leads to vacations to Malaga. And that's why you want it. Um, but no, b besides that, yeah, it, it's, so my point is, observability is a feature of a product. It's a business feature of a product, just as important as having a good UI, right, or a good UX, or having whatever business feature your, your product does. Having observability is equally important, and that's why this conversation needs to be. And it, are there any product owners here? Anyone a product owner? That's a shame, because this conversation should really be happening between technical people, engineers, and product owners, because that's the way you sort of sell why you need to invest time and effort into building observability into your system, is because it's a feature of your product, right? If you don't have it, you can't serve your customers as well as if you do. Right. So, for example, you don't have to have all of these uh, things to have observability, right? So the product I mainly work on, which is the Proofpoint CASB, Cloud Access Security Broker, um, we don't have like a separate technology for traces. We build a distributed tracing infra infrastructure on top of our logging infrastructure. Does it mean that our system doesn't have observability? No, it has a very good way of telling all the things, and I'll, I'll tell you some stories later. Uh, but it's not because we need all three of these, is because we built the things we want as a feature using a few tools right, at our disposal. And there are trade-offs, right? For example, we use our logging uh, infrastructure to also do distributed tracing. And it, gives, it has advantages because we have very good data and it's already working because we had logging to begin with. It has disadvantages because it's much more expensive, right? It's, we're building it on top of a system which is less tracing, and so we pay more resources and overhead and money to support this. And so maybe eventually it will be worth our while to refactor this whole thing and use like a separate standalone product just for tracing. And maybe not. We'll, we'll look into it once it actually starts hurting enough to rethink how we do it. But the important thing is, if you ask me now if my system is working, I can tell you for sure. Well, actually, right now I have no idea. Because if I open my laptop and I go check the monitoring, I can tell you for sure if it's working, if not, what exactly isn't working, and who is the person who's responsible for fixing the specific thing that's not working. Right. And so before we start talking about you know, how to build observability, we need to actually define how do you know something isn't working? What is wrong, right? And this brings us to a topic um, which, by the way, all I stole more or less straight out of the, out of the Google service uh, SRE, Service Reliability Handbook, which is a couple of books that Google published, which I think everybody should read. It doesn't matter if you're you know, an architect or a developer. It has a bunch of information about how Google think about service reliability which is applicable to everybody. And I really like it as a concept. And so I think it's a free book. If you, go, if you Google, Google SRE book, you'll find it. And uh, it's free. Just download it, read it. 
has a bunch of really interesting insights about how they think of service reliability and customer, uh, customer experience. And so one of the things that they define and is generally pretty accepted across the industry is something called service uh, level indicators. Right? I'm sure everyone knows the term SLA, service level agreement, is something you have with customer. Our SLA could be, for example, your system responds within X milliseconds, or your system has an uptime of 9.9 you know, and 9 something percent. 99 something, 9 would be very bad. Um, okay, so service level indicators are s a type of monitoring or a uh, type of signal which tells you whether a particular service is healthy. In order to do that, you have to define uh, some kind of service level objective, which means, let's say my objective is our website loads within one second. That's our service level objective. And I can measure it and I say, does our service conform to that objective? So I can have a service level indicator which says, are we above or below the objective? And so if, it's, if we're above the objective, I can alert something, I can go and look something, right? It's a strong signal. And so that's what we want. We, before we start diagnosing the problem, in order to know that there is a problem, we need to have a strong signal which tells us this is something that's outside of our expected range. And it could be something like latency or if your system is for example, in our case, our system is very asynchronous, so we don't care so much about individual latency, but we care about throughput, so how many requests are getting served per second. And so we can define certain levels of expectation of how things operate, and then if things operate outside of those levels, we can say that the service level indicator is uh, out of the expected range, right? And so they need to be very simple and very easy to define, which is not easy to do at all, right? It needs to be very easy to read. Like, so, for example, this thing, this is one of the dashboards that hangs um, at our development center where I work. Uh, and our floor is divided more or less equally between the area where the product owners and customer success and research and um, the R&D head sit. And on the other side of the floor is a bunch of engineers. And so this thing hangs on the wall near all the product people and the customer success. And this is their service level indicator board. And uh, if you look at it, this relates to our products. Every column is a major feature of our, of our system. So for example, being able to, able to process a, a certain type of event or respond to a certain type of uh, incident. And the rows, which I marked out, but they're a list, a rotating list of customers. And each one of those represents a customer which has a specific use case, maybe using one technology or a size. And so the list keeps rotati rotating and the whole board needs to represent enough use cases to cover our entire system, right? And so I'm using it, I caught it on a day when we were having a bit of trouble. That's why a lot of it is red. And so if, if uh, how many people have been to the lightning talk and heard uh, Randy Schaup talk about uh, scaling systems? There's like one person, okay. So he closed his on saying that every system is shit. And, and this is, uh, well, he was a bit glib, but the point is, nobody is, nothing is perfect, and so this system is good enough, it's not perfect. So for example, this whole row is a false positive. Because I checked, uh, this customer shouldn't have been on the board. And so the whole thing is red and we should have just removed it. It's not an actual problem. And one of the other rows, it's just miscalibrated. So it says we have 179 events out of 200, which is close enough to 200. And so this was early morning. And so it was just under the threshold, but that wasn't the problem. And so it just means that for this service level indicator, we just didn't calibrate it correctly. We need to recalibrate and bring down the threshold so it stops looking like a problem because it's not a problem. And one of these is an actual problem. There was one where there were too, many, too few events and we actually found a problem and fixed it. Okay, and so something like service level indicators, it needs to be very clear. So red and, white, uh, red and uh, green, it's not because we think our product people are stupid and they can only get like two colors. Um, it's because it, we need a strong signal to go and figure out if something is wrong right now. Right? It doesn't need to be very complicated. It needs to project a very clear message. Um, and yes, it means you need to iterate over it. You need to actually continuously go and recalibrate your service level indicator until you get somewhere where you're happy with it. And so you need to adjust it only infrequently. Right? And so um, on the other side of the floor where all the engineers sit, we have a different dashboard, which I can show you unfortunately because it reveals too many uh, internal details of our system. And so instead, I'm gonna show you uh, a different one. How many people know of Reddit? Everybody knows Reddit. So this is the Reddit status page uh, at status page IO. We internally, we also use status page. Our internal status board looks very much like this on the engineering side. And this shows pretty much the same concepts, right? It's very clearly customer focused, right? It shows the stuff 
that the customers actually care about. Is the website up? Is the mobile ap application up? Uh, how many errors are, you know, are the, uh, is the vote processing uh, going correctly? All the stuff that tells you, is anything broadly wrong or not wrong? It, do it doesn't give you metrics, it doesn't give you graphs, well, a couple of them, but they're not like in-depth graphs. It tells you specific things that are very customer business oriented. We want from service level indicator because usually that's our starting, starting point for investigating problems. And once we get beyond that, we can go and can dig deeper into various things we have to actually discover what the problem is, right? And that brings us to metrics because that's the next thing you would expect to actually have, right? So when I say metrics, again, I said it's application level metrics, not necessarily you know, CPU and disk and stuff, which you should have. You should definitely have CPU and, you know, and disk indicators, or at least you know, somewhere in ops, there's someone who, ha who cares about this stuff. Uh, but for developers, primarily, we want to know about application level stuff. And so metrics have the advantage of being very cheap compared to all the other te uh, technologies you can use to get visibility. Metrics is by far the cheapest one, and the reason they're cheap is because we can aggregate a lot of information into a very small amount of data points, right? For example, let's say our microservice accepts requests, and we want to count how many requests we get. And so we have 1,000 requests per second, and usually when you sh send this to a metrics aggregator, it takes the 1,000 requests, converts it into a single integer, 1,000, and the second, and sends that. And so we take a lot of data, we aggregate it into a very small data item, and we can store a lot of those, right? And you can aggregate it by second or by minute if you want to store even more data in, in small size and so on. Uh, and so you can have a lot of metrics, right? It's perfectly fine. In our system, we have over 100,000 unique individual metrics, where unique means you know, per server, per customer, per user, and so on. And so we have a lot of unique metrics, and we can track all of them because it's very cheap for each one of those. The downside of metrics, of course, is because we aggregate them, right? And so because we compress all this data, instead of having a, a thousand individual unique metrics for that one second, we just have one big one, right? One that does 1,000. And because we lose all this context data, we can miss important things which hide inside the granularity. So for example, if we have a service uh, serving 1,000 requests per second, maybe they're all equal. So every request takes you know, a couple of milliseconds and they're spread out throughout the second evenly. But maybe in some cases, if you were to graph the individual uh, requests, you would notice that there would be 90, uh, 900 milliseconds of nothing and then 100 milliseconds of all the requests. And then you dig deeper and discover that, oh, this service does a lot of garbage collection. And when garbage collection kicks in, instead of returning every request in five milliseconds, what it does is just does nothing for a second and then suddenly all the requests come back. And so you have a massive latency spike, but you don't notice it because you compressed the metric range into one second. And you do it for good reasons, because you, you, otherwise you wouldn't be able to store them, but you lose a lot of important context, right? And so this is, um, this is why it's important to have multiple views on the same data, so you can actually find this context. For example, if this was indeed a problem with the garbage collection, maybe we'll, co we'll collect other metrics whenever garbage collection happens, and we can look at those and figure out, oh yeah, so there's garbage collection going on, let's look at the latency. Or maybe you collect latency metrics, right? So not, no single metric can probably give you the full picture. And so that's the downside where you actually lose data fidelity, but the upside is you can have a lot of them and very cheaply. This is an example of our metrics. Uh, I took up like a random dashboard from one of our uh, metric servers. And so if you look at this, it's very clearly not service health indicators, right? If I, want, if I wanted to look at this and you ask me, okay, is, is our service okay? I have no idea. I'd have to read into this and like, look at all the graphs and try to figure out, is this okay? Like, is that thing looks spiky, is that normal? I don't know. By the way, this, as it happens, is not okay. Uh, because this came, the screenshot came from an incident we had where... Okay, let me give you some background, right? So one of the things we do with Casby is we track user login sessions from our customers' accounts. And so we look at every login event and we try to figure out if it's a legitimate login event or if it's an attack. And so let's say if, if you have a customer that's based in Texas and we see a login event from Nigeria, that's clear, clearly suspicious, right? And then we run some heuristics on it and figure out if that login is indeed a proper login or if it's an attack. And if it is, you know, we do something. We do some kind of remediation and then, you know, we block the Prince of Nigeria and, and kick him out of the system. Um, 
So the quicker we can do this, obviously the better, right? Because this, is re this reduces what's called the dwell time, which is the amount of time the attacker can spend in the system. And so the more dwell time he has, the more time he has to do damage and spread out laterally. And we want to reduce that as much as possible. And so we had an incident where we had uh, a sudden spike in dwell time, which means from the moment we got events into the system until we actually finished processing all the events and figure out if they're OK, it was taking way longer than we expected, which is a major system level indicator for us. Right, we care about dwell time a lot because that's the service we give to our customers. Uh, and so we went looking for it, right? And because the first place we look is in the system that's actually running heuristics, which is where this sh screenshot came from, um, it seemed okay. Everything looks okay. Nothing is like at 100% CPU. And so the only thing that was weird is there's a weird batching going on in the top left corner, right? Instead of being flat, we see spikes and then nothing, spikes and then nothing. And this is the thing that says how many messages we still have left to process in the rule engine that does the heuristics. And this should always be fairly flat, because that's the average amount of events getting into the system. So what this says is, somewhere upstream, before the system, there's something else, a different component, which is not functional correctly. And so we went digging into our metrics. We found the metrics of the thing that was doing user enrichment on the events before the system. And so the way you do user enrichment, you take an event, you go to a database, you get the user details, and you uh, attach them to the event. And then you send the events to the rule engine that does all the heuristics. And so enrichment was taking too long. And so we started digging, why is the enrichment taking too long? We went to a different dashboard and eventually found that the database it was using to get the user data was at 100% CPU. Why was it at 100% CPU? At this point, we ran out of metrics to check. And so we went to logs. And we looked at all the request logs. And we found that there was a high level of requests of an unusual type, which normally don't happen. So we went to see what the source of it, and we traced it down to a laptop uh, of some one of the users. And long story short, this is why uh, our security researchers don't have direct access to our production elastic search anymore. Um, no, we, we didn't just kick them out, right? Obviously, um, so they were doing legitimate research on the cluster. That's the, where the data was. Um, so we politely asked them to stop because it was killing the production server. Um, and then we came up with a different system which copied the data somewhere else, and they could query that as much as they want. But the point is, this whole thing took about half an hour. Right? From the moment we figured out that there's an issue to the moment where I went and politely asked them to stop running Python queries on our, on our production server, um, that didn't take very long. Like a year ago, this would have probably taken about a day, maybe more, at least two people are researching it. And so doing this in half an hour with a single person is a massive difference because, first of all, obviously we improved service for our customers half an hour of dwell time versus like a day and a half. Um, it, it saved two, two days of work for someone, so they could put this work towards something more useful than researching a production outage. Uh, we learned a bunch of stuff, and we came up with a different system instead of it. Okay, and this is the point of why we want to have multiple tools to provide observability, right? We want to have something that alerts us that when there is a problem, and then enough things that you can follow the chain and zoom down on where the problem actually is. Okay, and so metrics are one of the best tools you can have to diagnose systemic problems like latency and load and something not being quite right. And so you can look at those, but that's never something, you, not, that's never the first place you look, right? Because if you go and you look at the metrics dashboard, you can't really tell if something is wrong. If you look here, you can tell something is wrong. Then you can go and investigate this and dig, it, dig deeper. Okay. So from this, this brings us to logs, right? So, well, okay, let, let me, before we go into logs, uh, which I'm sure everyone understands what logging is, um, how many people have centralized logging in their system? Most people, right? Uh, those of you who don't, you really, really should have. It's great. Um, how many people have some kind of application level metrics collected and stored in the system, which is one place where you can go and look at all the metrics? Almost as many people. How many people have distributed traces where you can go and you can look at one place it sh that shows your transaction across the entire system? It's four, five, okay. So that's about what I expected because that's how, how familiar the technologies are. So everyone has logging, right? Every, logging has been around forever. You know, when the first Neolithic developer sat down in front of a green and black terminal and banged rocks on the mechanical keyboard and they produced the first ever uh, program which said, hello world. And then they compiled and ran it, and it didn't work exactly. And the next two lines in the history of programming were a print statement before and a print statement after to test why this, the one in the middle didn't work. And that's how logging was invented. 
Um, so logging has been around for a long time, and logging works really well. Everyone understands it. Um, the thing is, most people just look at logs and say, well, okay, yeah, I can figure out what stuff happened in the past. And this is indeed the primary use case for logs, which is looking at the state of your system sometime in the past. And hopefully you have good enough logs uh, that you can actually figure out what the state was. So for example, let me give you an example of what's a good log and what's a bad log. So a bad log is um, user enrichment failed, period. That's a very bad log line, right? Or you know, request succeeded. Which request? We have millions of requests, right? So, and it's very easy to take something like this and turn it into a good log line, right? You, instead of using uh, enrichment failed, you say enrichment for user ID blah, customer blah, failed because of blah, right? It's very easy to turn, turn the bad log into a good log. Um, and so that's like the first thing you actually want to do. And when, when I joined Proofpoint, that was one of our main issues. We had a bunch of logs which were leftovers from people just lo doing local traces on their machines, and they found their way in production. And so our production logs were full of requests succeeded. Great, okay, why do I need this in my production logs? Um, and so like that, that's one of the first things we did. We refactored all the logs, we moved them out into something that was uh, templated and had a very, like, very strict signature, and it had a lot of context so you can know what the log is actually talking about. Uh, and that, that helped a lot, right? And we cleaned out a lot of our logs. Um, the other problem was massive overlogging, right? So unlike metrics, which are very cheap, Logging is the opposite, right? Logging is probably the most expensive way to gain observability that you can have. Because logs have a lot of information, you usually have a lot of logs, because if you consider, you know, we have, let's say, 100 microservices right now, uh, a billion requests per day, every service produces, let's say, five messages in the logs, you multiply by that, and every day we produce more data f just from logs than the actual data in our databases, right? And it's a massive amount of data to index and store and manage and, all, and so on. So it's very expensive. On the upside, though, it, it has very high fidelity. You can put a lot of information into logs. It's very granular. You can track every request with logs. You can figure out wh exactly what the server is doing. And you can put in you know, the tr uh, stack traces and anything you want into logs. So it's a very good way to get visibility. It's just very expensive. And so you have to find some kind of uh, trade-off between metrics and logs. And, and we'll talk about traces in just a bit. Um, and usually, the trade-off is, uh, okay, we want to put all this stuff in the logs. We don't want to pay too much money for the logs, and so we're going to reduce the retention period. We're not going to store, let's say, a month worth of logs. We'll store just a week worth of logs, and that's going to cost us less because you know, it's a much smaller data set. We can rotate them. Uh, but then again, you're losing fidelity. You can go and say, well, this server behaved this way a month ago, and now it's doing something different. You don't have logs from a month ago. It's too expensive. Okay, and so this is something to consider, and how you actually treat logs and the actual technologies of how you store and centralize logs. Uh, so how many people are running some kind of elastic stack, Elk, something, like two, or Splunk? Oh, right. Anything else? Is there someone, like, so when I asked earlier who was doing centralized logging, like half the room, sir? Okay, cool. So yeah, so there's a lot of tools you can use, and I honestly don't care if, it, if it's doing the job and if it takes the text in and indexes it, good, it's fine. This, that's not the point, right? Having logs and having them centralized and accessible is important. But there's other things you can do with logs, right? So, for example, um, one of the first things we did, uh, because our system is so spread out and distributed, was once we figured out logging for a, for a single service, we started thinking of, okay, so we have a request coming in from one side, we expect it to come out the other side of the system, and sometimes it doesn't. How do we know where it, where it stops and where it drops, right? And, and, or what happened to it on the way? And so the first thing we did was use the existing logging infrastructure to assign every request some kind of ID at the start, some kind of trace ID, and then persist it and send it over to every service. And so every service would add that ID to the log, right? And so suddenly we, th we gained a way to connect all the different trace logs of a single request from all the services. And now we can go in, into our, well, we use Elk. I could go into Elasticsearch and I say, OK, give me all the logs related to this transaction, transaction ID. And I get a bunch of logs, like there'll be you know, thousands of log lines. But then at least I, can, I have a way to investigate a problem, right? It's not a very good way, right? It's, it's still very hard and manual to go through a thousand line, lines of log. But it's much better than having nothing at all. Right, and so this brings us much closer to what we're going to talk about for the rest of it of the talk, which is distributed tracing. Right, and so once you actually have this 
something, some kind of ID which connects all of your different services throughout the system to one transaction, and you manage to propagate it from service to service, you're one step closer to having distributed tracing. Right? And so that's where we are right now. We don't have like a separate stack of technologies to do just distributed tracing. We use logs for that, and we built a lot of tooling around it so it makes it much easier. So for example, if I know that um, we're losing data somewhere or something is not processing, I can go and pick a trace and go into one of our dashboards and pull up everything to do with that particular request. Uh, and, and because when we started doing this, in order to persist the trace ID from one service to another, we just put it on the data object itself. Uh, it's also stored on every data object. Uh, so we have an automation system which runs in the background and continuously tests uh, flows end to end through the system. It runs different scenarios and figures out which things work and don't work. And that system automatically takes the trace ID, finds all the logs from, uh, from Elasticsearch, and finds all the data items from the databases compares them, and that's how our automation knows that the test passed or failed, right? And so you don't have to use the logs just as logs, right? They can be used as a basis for a lot of very useful and automatic testing uh, once you have something that connects all the different services to one event, right? And so um, this is a good start, but obviously it's not good enough because uh, sometimes when you have an event coming in into a system, it can split into multiple events. For example, let's say we have a web request to an API, and so this AI request produces two separate calls, one that stores one type of object to the database and a different call that stores a different type of object to a different database. Right? And so you have a, a fork in the request chain. And so now how do you treat those? Is this still the same request? Do you need to start new, two new transactions, two new traces? So it's not very clear and it's very still it's kind of hard to do and based on logging. But again, it's better than nothing. And so from here, the next obvious step is to go to actual distributed tracing. And distributed tracing is a, is a set of technologies that deals exactly with that, right? It lets you define what's a transaction. In this case, a transaction is something that is a single logical operation end-to-end -end that spans across your system and relates to one particular event, one initiating event, right? So for example, if you're in microservices and it's synchronous, let's say a user clicking a button and doing a single REST request to your server with the entire chain of services that get called, all the database queries, all the things that happen afterwards, that's part of the same transaction. In our system, for example, we don't have that much REST stuff. It's all asynchronous based on Kafka, but a single login session that happens in the cloud on our customer system generates an event which goes into our system and then it splits and then we do a bunch of stuff and enrich it and everything, every service it touches relates to the same transaction. Right. And so in order to actually make sure that we can connect all of those things together, the one thing we need to solve is how do we persist the context of the transaction from service to service? Right. How do we move this transaction ID that we assigned to the, uh, to the transaction between all the services? Right. And so we do it in a slightly primitive way, which is just put it on the data objects themselves. Uh, there are technologies which abstract that away for you. And so they actually use the transport layer. So if it's HTTP, HTTP headers, if it's like a message interface like Kafka or RabbitMQ, they all support message headers, and so it abstracts it nicely into message headers, and you don't have to deal with all this stuff yourself. It's nicely wrapped away and abstracted away for you, and so all you need to do is that you need to capture this context and do something with it. Right? And so that's, the, that's basically how distributed tracing works in a nutshell. Right? Let's say we have a very simple scenario. We have three services, A, B, and C. We'll imagine that service A is some kind of front-end web server. Right, and it gets a web request. It sends a web request to a service B, which is a backend server. And then the backend server does something like send a Kafka message or a rabbit message to a third service, service C. Right? And so we have two chains of uh, data flow here. We have the inbound, uh, in, uh, inbound uh, data, the stuff that goes on the wire. And so we assign some kind of transaction ID to this new operation. And we only send the minimal context, as little data as possible, from service to service together with the actual requests. But whenever we hit one of the services, we send out a much larger log of the process to some collector, which takes that and puts it somewhere else. And so conceptually, this works very similarly to the way logs work, right? So logging, usually you have some kind of log collector, which you shove logs at it, and then it takes them out of the process puts them in some kind of locked collector, and eventually everything ends up in a, in a big database, and you index it and you query it. So tracing conceptually works the same. The main difference is 
you persist the context of the trace from one service to, a ser to, to the next. And whenever you hit a particular service, you take this context, you build a large log object around it, and then you persist it through a separate tracing collector, which is very similar to a log collector. And we'll see in a bit when we start talking about the different tools that they're all very similar to log collection tools, right? A lot of these tools use Elasticsearch in the backend because it's very easy to, uh, to index stuff. Um, and internally, it's very similar. But the main difference is there's two things. One is we have something that's moving through the system and actually helps you connect different uh, parts of the system together. And the other is the idea of a span. So a span, uh, and this uh, a lot of the distributed tracing stuff is based on work that Google did uh, over a decade ago. And they released a paper called uh, Google, uh, they have a system called Dapper, which does distributed tracing. They, they released a white paper in 2010 describing how it works. So a lot of the, like, the modern concepts of distributed tracing can be traced, traced uh, back to the work Google did with Dapper. Uh, and so my, many of the current open source systems kind of mimic what they did there. And so this idea uh, that they have of a transaction and a span is very root, deeply rooted in, in all the tracing systems today. Right, so a span uh, encompasses a single logical unit of work that you, want to tr that you want to track and measure. So for example, a span could be a request from one service to the next. Right, so a span A starts uh, when service A begins a request and it ends inside service B when the request is actually received. And maybe a new span starts inside service B when it calls to a database and returns. And that's another span and we close it. Right? And so every span has a start time and an end time and it has the trace ID because we're tracing a whole thing through the system here. And it has the span ID to, to identify the actual span that we're doing. And it has a bunch of metadata. So for example, in this case, we can have things like attached tags to it. Uh, and importantly, we have something called a relationship between spans. And so whenever we create new spans out of all out of the previous ones, we want to know how they relate to each other. So for example, if you look at this diagram, we can imagine that this is two service calls. One is uh, a call to a uh, REST service. It creates span A, and it calls uh, something, the span B, synchronously. Presumably, it calls a different service. And so span B is a child of span A, right? It's a uh, synchronous dependency of span A. And so anything that's actually, any span that's actually a dependency of a previous span, it needs to finish before the previous is finished, is a child of that span. And we can go and see that span F is actually unrelated to, to, uh, to A. A is finished, and maybe it's posted a message to RabbitMQ. And so uh, a different service picked up the message. And now we have span F, which is not a child of, B of A because it's not related to it. It follows B, right? It's, it logically is related, but it's not a child of it. There's no dependency. And so we have these two relations. And so once we have all these relationships defined between spans and a trace ID connecting all of them, we can build a very good diagram of exactly how the transaction actually happened in the system. We can see all the dependencies, we can compare the times, and we can see how much every one of the spans and every unit of work actually took. We can track a lot of those, and we can start making statistics on different spans. This span takes you know, so long, and if it changes, then we need to go and look why this changed. Right? So once we have all this information, we can start making much higher level observations about the system. And we can make much better uh, better actionable insights about the system. Is a particular service slow? Is it outside of SLA, right? Now we can redefine SLA to be much more broad. So for example, in our system, a transaction goes from one end to the other, and we can have a service level indicator just measuring how long full transaction takes. And if that goes up, then we need to go and look at something. We can also define a different S uh, SLI that says just the rule evaluation subsystem Let's measure that. And so if the rule evaluation takes longer, we can have a different SLA, and we can go and look at that. Right? And so we can base this on much better understanding of how the whole transaction works. And so if we, for example, know that there are some problems with a part of our system, which didn't have good observability before, if we have tracing through it, we can go and you add specifically more tooling around that area, more logging, more uh, alerts on top of it, and get much better visibility into that. And so, as I was talking before, um, the main value of actually adding tracing, to, uh, distributed tracing to your system, is a business value. It's a business-oriented feature, because once you have all of this data, you can gain insights which relate to customer experience. Right? You can actually make the customer experience better. You can make uh, better SLIs. Uh, 
you can provide better service to your customers. And so any conversation with anyone about tracing and observability should start with, well, right now we can't provide good service to our customers, and we should. And so let's invest a bit more into observability and tracing. Uh, but if you dig deep into like, the technical aspects of it, um, a lot of uh, root cause analysis can be improved by having distributed traces. Let's say you know that something is going wrong because you have good SLIs on it. Now you want to figure out exactly where it's wrong. If you have a full trace of the system, you can go and you can zoom in on each individual part and you can look in that and see if something changed. If you can find a way to connect that to your deployment system, which by the way is one of the things I really want to do next, so it's on our roadmap, uh, which is connect our Jenkins server to our metrics system so that every time we deploy something, it actually puts a mark on our metrics so we know this is where something got deployed and something changed. And uh, I'm not sure why we didn't that do that before. We will definitely do it within the next month or so. Uh, but that's like one of the things you want to do. You want to connect traces with something that says, okay, a change happened here, and then you can get much better root cause analysis, right? If you know something broke and you go and see, that, okay, there was a deployment, let's connect that to a metric. Oh, so a latency came up. And so unless you have this, if you have very, just very uh, high-level metrics, notice it. For example, let's say your SLI is, your end-to-end -end latency should be one second. Then you go and you deploy a new service, and that service is five milliseconds out of that one second. You deploy a new service, which has a regression, and it doubles the latency of the service. It goes from five milliseconds to 10 milliseconds. But if you're only measuring the end-to-end -end latency, it'll go from one second to one second and five milliseconds, which is a tiny change and none of your uh, metrics or monitoring system will actually pick up the change. But if you have a granular enough look into the service, you'll see that this particular service suddenly doubled in latency, and so that's a big indicator. Right? And so if you don't collect both the high-level and the low-level information, you will not have this access. And so the, and the third uh, reason to use this is exactly that. Commonly, this is referred to as application performance metrics, APM. Uh, and so this is, again, a big... There's a lot of hype around APM. A lot of vendors have added APM abilities to their, uh, to their tools. So for example, Elastic have added an APM module to Elasticsearch, where you can dump a bunch of application metrics into it and it has nice graphs and stuff in Kibana. Uh, it also added a distributed system. And there's a lot of new, uh, new services like Datadog and Lightstep and, this, and basically all the vendors which have very good APM tools to go and track all of your application performance metrics and give you that insight. So I want to talk about how exactly you do distributed tracing. And again, because I'm, I'm going to focus on this a bit more because everyone gets logging, more or less everybody gets metric, and not as many people get, get tracing. So I want to dig into that. And so tracing basically is um, you need to address four concerns if you want to have distributed traces. The first, of course, is instrumenting your applications, right? Just like with logging, you have to go in, uh, into the application and add code which will deal with traces and emit traces out into the collector. Right? And so we'll talk in a bit about tools which let you do that. But generally, you want to have traces at the boundaries between different processes. And usually, the boundaries between processes are nicely wrapped in abstractions because they're usually HTTP or message passing or something where you use a well-known protocol to send messages. So if it's HTTP, you're using some kind of HTTP client. Hopefully, it's wrapped in some kind of common layer abstraction, and you can go and just instrument that and get very good coverage, because if every service in your application uses your HTTP client wrapper, you add the instrumentation for tracing in one place, and suddenly you cover all of your services. Same thing with messages, you know, Akka, Ka Kafka, or RabbitMQ, any of those. If you have some kind of wrapper over the driver, you go and you instrument the wrapper for the driver, and then you cover everything with, the, with that one change. If you don't have that, then that's something you should start with, right? If you don't have a good uh, abstraction and, or a good way of refactoring or factoring out common things which deal with transport, do that first, and then we'll have a good way of instrumenting large chunks of your system with metrics and traces and logging. By the way, this, the same place where you want to add traces is always a good place to add metrics as well, right? Because if you're going to send Kafka messages, you might as well count them, how many messages you sent. If you're going to do web requests, you might as well count how many the, uh, you sent and how long they took. Because you know, metrics are cheap, so you might as well add those as well. And so when you have, once you have all of your code instrumented, or at least the important parts of your code, and by the way, the, the important thing and what we learned from uh, instrumenting a lot of our services, it's much better 
to start with the critical parts of your system and instrument those than the non-critical parts. Because initially, our, we felt that well, it's a new technology, we don't want to take a risk. Let's add tracing to some small part of the system we don't want to care about too much and we're not worried if it breaks. And so we did that and it didn't produce any value because that it wasn't an important part of the system. And so adding observability there didn't improve anything. We didn't care about it in the, to begin with. And so there was no value to doing that. And so we said, okay, well, let's try it in something important. And we added it to the core of our rule evaluation engine. And once we did that, we suddenly got visibility into things that were entirely broken and were on fire a lot of the time. And then we could put out the fire. And that was wonderful. And so doing this and being brave and adding tracing and instrumentation into the middle of the core of your system has a lot more value. And so you can immediately say, that, okay, we'll improve this, right? This is something you can take to your business. You can say, take that to your product owner and, says, and say, you know, this is something we did and it has a lot of value. Let's do some more of it. Or we'll, let's also do this somewhere else, right? So don't be afraid to go and actually add observability to the critical parts of your system because if you do it in the not critical, you won't get any value because that's why they're not critical. Um, and so once you have that, you can collect all your data. Uh, there are very common, and we'll talk about this in a bit, common collectors for trace data, just like you do with, log, uh, with logging. Like if you do logs, let's say you start a new service, what's the, some, one of the first things you do, if it's in .NET, you go, you add log4j into the dependencies. If it's Java, sorry, log4net. If it's Java, you, you know, add log4j and log, and log back. If it's whatever, I don't know what other people use. Like there's probably something like that for JavaScript, which I guess, I don't know. Uh, no, I'm sure there's, there's uh, I don't know, Java pe JavaScript people help me out. Uh, Watson, thank you, I, actually that, that's correct. Uh, and there's something that for everything, right? So logging is actually a well-solved problem and you do add instrumentation collecting for that. There is an equivalent for that pretty much uh, for every normal common framework for tracing. Um, the problem with that, there's a lot of them. And so there are a lot of standards uh, for how you can collect traces. Uh, there is a new standard called Open Tracing. It's a project. Uh, one of the founders is Ben Siegelman. He's an ex googler He worked on Google's Dapper and did a lot of the work in distributed tracing. And so he is one of the co-founders of the Open Tracing project. The other one is an Open Census, which attempts to do something very similar. Um, and open metrics is something that is a project that tries to do something similar, but for metrics. And so there's a bunch of standards, right? There's no one standard. Uh, the good news is open tracing and open census announced that they're going to merge last month. So hopefully we'll have one less standard. Uh, and eventually maybe there will be just one thing that lets you do tracing properly. Uh, but my recommendation would be if you're going to do, do this now, try open tracing first. It's very simple to use. And the advantage of open tracing over other uh, libraries is it tries to solve a very narrow problem. It, it only addresses instrumenting your services and emitting data. And the only thing it does is propagate the trace context from service to service, right? So it, it's just a set of libraries for .NET, Java, uh, Python, Go, Node.js, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and all it does is help you instrument services with HTTP or Kafka, uh, and it, it adds some common wrappers around uh, headers to propagate the trace context from service to service. That's all it solves. Now, that's a big, a big problem to solve. I think that's enough for one project. Uh, Open Census tries to be much more opinionated. It's trying to solve both that and how you collect the data and how you uh, present it. And so it does too much stuff. And so it doesn't really um, go into in depth into any of them. And it's not as convenient. So Open Tracing would be my go-to. Open Metrics is trying to do the same thing for collecting metrics which I'm kind of indecided about because there's a lot of existing standards for collecting metrics, and this is one more. This is like the 15 standards for collecting metrics. But we'll see if it works out. And so, as I said, once you collect the metrics, uh, you need to index them and you need to actually query them and visualize them. And so when I say index them, uh, I do mean like index as in uh, put them in a database somewhere and then prepare them to be queried. And which is why a lot of the uh, a lot of the common uh, open source projects that collect traces use the same set of technologies. It's usually either Apache Cassandra or Elasticsearch, pretty much the same technologies you often use for logging uh, because they give you a very nice open source platform for just getting a bunch of data and doing queries on it. All right. Um, the main problem to remember, if you remember, we'll talk about metrics. Metrics are cheap, which use data fidelity. 
logs are very expensive, but you have very high data fidelity and high context. The problem with traces is there's just so many of them. If you do distributed tracing, you're going to have even more data than you do with logs. And that's very expensive to collect, because usually when you emit a trace out of the process, you overload a lot of data onto it, a bunch of tags and contexts and logs. And if it's an error, you put a stack trace in there. And they're very fat objects, and you get one of those for every span, and you have multiple spans for every service. And so you c every request in your system generates you know, megabytes of data, much more than the actual data of, of what you're storing. Um, and so a common way of dealing with that is to sample traces, right? You don't store all the traces. You do some kind of sampling, and so you, s you pick some of them, a representative statistical sample of traces, and you measure those. Now, right there, obviously, you lose fidelity because you lose a large part of your data. Same problem as with metrics. But for the kind of problems we're trying to solve with distributed traces, it's mostly OK, right? Because if you can take one sample and trace through the entire system, it will give you enough representation uh, because things don't usually change over time uh, that quickly, right? B the kind of things you measure, latencies over large spans of uh, your system, don't change very quickly. And so usually sampling is a good enough compromise between logs and metrics to have this in tracing. Um, and so the way you, you do sampling is very important because that pretty much forms the basis of what you can do with your traces. So some common ways of doing this is, well, we have random sampling. We'll say, okay, we'll sample one of, out of every thousand traces for every service. The naive and very easy way to do it, uh, pretty much every sampling collector you can get, every library supports that. You can just say, okay, sample one out of every thousand messages or one out of you know, every hundred, whatever. And so every service will emit much less data. Of course, that means that for one trace, most likely you won't have a full trace, right? So we'll never be able to reconstruct one transaction because parts of it got out sampled out and most likely you will never get a full trace of a single transaction. You'll just get uh, measures of spans. They're good measures, right? Because statistically they're going to be good enough, but that's a very good, bad way of doing it. A better way of doing it would be to decide sampling in advance. The first service that generates a transaction ID also puts some kind of an information on it that says, should you sample this or not? And then the first service decides, you know, one out of every hundred messages, this is the message everybody is going to use for sampling. And so you can guarantee that one trace will be preserved fully. Uh, but the downside is, if it splits into multiple operations, what's one sample on the front-end server is going to be 100 samples somewhere down the line. So you don't have as much of a control for in every service. Other ways would be doing uh, predictive sampling. So you say, I want to have at most 10 messages per second sampled from the service. And so it will drop messages until it, it actually gets to, let's say, 10 per second. Um, you will definitely want to be able to say, this message should ignore sampling. For example, we have automation uh, running on our system. It keeps running end-to-end -end scenarios. And so if we're running an automation run through the system, I want all, this, all the traces to be actually stored, right? I don't want the sampling to like, randomly throw out some of the automation messages. So if I'm starting an automation probe, I'll mark it as don't sample this, right? This is exempt from actually being sampled out. And so I'll get the full trace and store that somewhere else because our automation framework uses that to determine if the test actually succeeded. And so there's a lot of complication and a lot of depth you can go into sampling. Um, and that becomes like a whole big separate topic. But generally speaking, you want to uh, have traces fall somewhere between the amount of data you get with logs and metrics. Um, and so once you have all this data, Finally, we get to the, like, the useful part of it. What do you do with this? Right? So you collect all of these distributed samples. It's awesome. It's wonderful. You can feel good about yourselves. <laughs> what, 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 what good is it? Is it right? And so there are some common uh, visualizations you can do on it. Um, pretty much all the tools, I'll show you some of the tools in a bit. Pretty much all of them have some version of these two. Um, that doesn't mean that that's all you can do with them. You, can, you don't have to visualize traces. For example, the best use case we have right now doesn't actually visualize traces. The automation actually samples traces automatically and just fails the run or, do or doesn't, right? And so there's no visualization there at all. But a lot of the common use cases is to have like a waterfall graph. You take all the spans and you present them on a graph. Uh, how, how many people have seen the network diagram in, in Chrome or Firefox? We have like a request with different samples, very much like this. And you can take a trace and graph it and you can take a bunch of traces and do some averages. Uh, some tools let you compare traces. You can say, take one hour of traces today, compare it to one hour of traces yesterday, and tell me which services changed. 
And so it's very nice. Uh, and so that's very common. Uh, the other common would be uh, doing data flow diagrams. Because I have uh, the full context of which service tells, talks to which service, I can build a full diagram of my entire system. And I can mark stuff on this, and I can know which services call to which services. It's not as useful, because usually you're not surprised, because you built the services, so it's not a surprise when they talk to each other. But it's nice, and you know, it's, cool, it's cool for demos. Um, time series diagrams are very useful, like metrics. Uh, you can base a lot of metrics uh, and latency graphs based on uh, traces. Um, and then you, know, you can use your imagination. There's a bunch of stuff you can do with it, from just querying to showing you know, metrics to graphs or whatever. So real quick, I want to show you just a couple of tools so you can get a feel of like, what kind of visualizations you can get from it, and then we'll be done. Uh, so I, I split those up into two categories. One is tools that you actually host yourself. So they're op most of them are open source. Uh, those that are marked with the mark are commercial tools, but they're good commercial tools. Uh, all the rest of them are, uh, are open source, which is, again, the same warnings about open source apply to every product, right? If it's a company like LinkedIn or Uber, for example, uh, Jaeger is a project that Uber open sourced. And if you want to do exactly what Uber do, great, it fits for you. If you want something different, Uber are in charge of building most of the open source product, and if it's not exactly what you want, you can submit a pull request. Good luck. By the way, telling someone, you know, submit a pull request is like when my son wants to go for ice cream, and I say, okay, well, learn to drive and drive me to the ice cream place. He's seven, it doesn't really help. But it's technically correct. Submit a pull request. Um, so Zipkin and a few of those, they're, they're more or less good tools. They all basically get traces, put them in Elasticsearch or Cassandra, and give visualizations. On the other side are managed services, like Datadog and uh, Lightstep and a bunch of others. All the cloud platforms have built-in tooling for that. And of course, they're expensive, but there's a good reason for that. They give you not just like the baseline collecting traces and graphing them, they usually give you higher level insights, right? So uh, platforms like Datadog and Lightstep run a lot of heuristics. They'll, they'll sell machine learning. It's not really machine learning, it's just statistics. Uh, but they have a lot of work around doing anomaly detection and logging and, and monitoring and stuff that you would have to build yourself. So if you're in a place where you can afford to use those services, I highly recommend that, right? We looked at Datadog. We we'll probably will eventually move to Datadog because we like it a lot. It's really cool once we actually get the budget and all this stuff together. Um, and so if you're in a company which can afford to go and buy one of these services, that's, that would be probably like your first choice. The second choice would be to get one of the open source projects. And the absolute last choice would be to build something entirely yourself. This is a case of do as I say, not as I do, because we actually built a lot of the stuff ourselves and we regret it. And so let's look at a couple of uh, just representative samples. So this is a screen, uh, the new Elastic APM in Elasticsearch version 7, I think, uh, which can collect traces and present them. So as I said, the waterfall graph, uh, you can look at one, uh, one trace, you can look at a, a bunch of traces and get you know, the latencies and uh, like a nice representation of how this thing moves through your system. Um, and if it's, a, you know, if it's a concurrent trace, you'd have m multiple concurrent uh, uh, spans going together. Um, this is from the Jaeger UI. I picked this slide because this represents what I was talking about earlier of comparing two different traces. So you can see it's comparing one trace to another and it says that this trace now changed something and so there's uh, more latency going on in particular service, which I really like. I think it's a really cool feature um, because it can actually help you surface problems. And usually you have a lot of, surf a lot of services. You can't remember which one, uh, which one is doing what and being able to compare them in the UI visually, it's very cool. Um, so this one is uh, Zipkin, uh, which is another open source project. Uh, it pretty much does the same thing as Elastic APM. Uh, this example is from the Confluent uh, blog. Confluent who have like a uh, Kafka, um, open source Kafka solution. And so this represents a trace using Kafka streams, which they actually instrumented. And so you can just use the library and, and if you're using Kafka Streams, it will trace like all the process from one side of the, uh, of the application to the other. And so again, you see the same kind of uh, waterfall graph. You can dig into each one of them and see the details of the request and so on. Uh, this one comes from Apache Skywalking, which is very popular in China. Uh, pretty sure a lot of the QQ, Baidu, and all the services use them. Um, it also has all the like waterfall graphs and stuff. But they also have a built-in uh, service graph, which has shows all the service dependencies, which is pretty cool. I don't know how useful this is, but it just looks cool. Um, 
And last one, this is the AWS X-Ray. AWS X-Ray is the uh, metric service uh, in Amazon. Uh, Azure have the same thing with App Insights. Uh, Google Cloud has the same thing, which I forget the name, but it looks barely, basically the same. Um, the problem with these services is, and just it's a general problem I have with Amazon, they take things that the industry has and then implement them specifically not according to standards. So the, the SDK for the Amazon X-Ray does not support open tracing. Every other SDK supports open tracing bindings. The Amazon doesn't. But the actual tool is really cool and I would love to use it. It just annoys me that I can't instrument my application once with open tracing, which is vendor neutral and can support any vendor, and then send the traces to, uh, to Amazon X-Ray because it doesn't support it. And I can send it anywhere else. Right? Once I instrument my application with open tracing, I can send traces to Zipkin, and I can swap it to Jaeger, I can swap it to Elastic, and I wouldn't change anything in the application, but the one thing I can do, I, I can't send it to AWS X-Ray. Even though they have really cool visualizations, and the service itself is, okay, it's, it's very expensive. We, I did the math of how much would it cost to move our entire system to X-Ray if we didn't do any sampling. Without any sampling, it's gonna cost about a million dollars per month for the amount of traces we need to generate. Of course, if we do sampling of, let's say, one out of every 1,000 requests, it goes from a million to 1,000, which is much more reasonable for a service where you know, have billions of requests. If we do more sampling, let's say one out of every 10,000, it's $100 a month. I can pay $100 a month, it's no problem. Right, and so that's why sampling is important. It's not like, it's not, okay, a million sounds a lot, but if we did the same thing without sampling with Elasticsearch, we'd need a massive cluster, which would cost probably not a million, but several hundred thousand dollars a month, because if we don't do any sampling, it, just storing all this data would be very expensive, right? But Amazon are obviously just ridiculously expensive beyond that. Um, so that's pretty much it. Like, so I wanted to, see, uh, to show you a, a bit of the UI so you can get a feel of you know, what tracing can do for you. I ran over time, so I'm not gonna <laughs> do questions, but I'm happy to answer questions afterwards if you don't come up to me. Uh, I have no plans for the rest of the day, so if you see me, you can just come up, say, hey David, you wanna talk about tracing? Uh, well. Uh, other than that, thank you very much for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. Good job.